remove your full name for ending. We also want to let you know that if a problem occurs and if for any reason Zoom closes, please first try to re-enter the same Zoom room. Uh, and if that doesn't work, you can go to the lobby uh, on the visual schedule of the conference and that lobby is labeled help or ayuda uh, in Spanish. And we are very excited for this session, Critical Media Collaborations. And I will turn it over to the amazing uh, panel that we have today. Looking forward to a great session. Thank you all. Thank you, Noah. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Allison Trope. I'm a professor of communication at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. And I'm also the founder and director of Critical Media Project, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today. So we have quite a few um, presenters in this workshop, and we want this to be kind of a fun and collaborative workshop, um, sort of keeping with the title. So I'm just going to kind of go over what we're going to be doing. Um, we've set this up as participatory. So we're first going to set up the goals of the workshop. We're going talk about Critical Media Project um, as a collaborative initiative. And then I'm going to let all of our um, different collaborators introduce themselves and talk about how they have been a part of this project. And then we're going to do some breakout groups, some small, um, short breakout groups to sort of think about some provocations we're going to give you around collaboration. And then we're going to kind of come back and hopefully summarize. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of what we proposed and what we were interested in um, for this workshop. Um, we wanna think about collaboration in the spirit of Freire. We wanna think about collaboration as a transformative pedagogical tool. And we wanna think about it in terms of how critical media literacy as a global and local effort um, can be collaborative. So we're, we're really sort of working in the spirit of this conference as well to sort of think about the, the conference theme, but also to think about the fact that this is a free conference, that we are drawing people from all over the world, hopefully, and that um, this helps us, the free piece helps us bring collaboration into the mix. So with the workshop, we want to, we're interested in exploring as a group, the practice of collaboration, the value of collaboration, and really the radical possibilities that it can offer uh, to think about the further development of critical media literacy. And so what we want to kind of accomplish, hopefully through this, this workshop, is we want to identify structural obstacles to collaboration in the context of critical media literacy and collectively envision uh, alternative approaches tied to supporting critical media literacy, again, as a local and global practice and effort. The second goal we really have is to develop uh, a philosophy of collaboration. So we almost want to, through the workshop, develop like a manifesto um, or a vision statement. And we're gonna use Padlet to do that. And we're going to think about that again in terms of Freire and to consider collaboration as a political act, um, to consider collaboration as something that can be radical in the way it seeds dialogue among different constituents and stakeholders. So again, I want to spend a little bit of time um, setting up Critical Media Project, and I'm going to just share my screen and show you around a little bit. So this is a website that was developed um, in 2013. It launched, and it um, is collaborative in, in nature, but it is generally an educational initiative based in social identity um, and based in social justice. It takes a collaborative approach in the development of its resources, which we'll talk more about, and tools that really are interested in uh, seeding critical inquiry among youth, thinking, having them think about media norms and stereotypes, having them think about how to contextualize media norms and stereotypes historically and in relation to institutional structures of power, while, and this is a key part of what we do, opening up the possibility of counter narratives and youth activism through critical creation. Um, so I'm just going to show you uh, the mission page, and I'm going to kind of 
just walk through the, the mission statement a little bit. So as indicated on this page, Critical Media Project is aiming to foster a kind of exploration. So we're interested in observing and becoming cognizant of messages about identity that surface in everyday media and culture. We're interested in expanding. So we're interested in understanding and gaining perspective on historical, social, and political context of media representations of these various identities we look at. We're interested in excavating and explicating, um, critically decoding, developing skills to analyze the meanings and ideologies behind these representations of identity across media genres, across media platforms. And finally, again, on the critical creation piece, we're interested in expressing and engaging. We want um, youth that use our site to develop and deploy strategies and skills to create their own representations, to tell their own stories, and to create those counter narratives. As far as the other work we do, and I'm going to transition and let DJ take over for a minute while I share another part of the site. So DJ, why don't you introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about some of our programs. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is DJ Johnson. I am a professor in the Division of Media Arts and Practice at the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California, and I'm the Associate Director of Critical Media Project. Uh, so in addition to the web platform that Allison is showing you, we also have done a lot of efforts to expand the impact and outreach of our work. So in addition to the curricular interventions, we've established public programs one of which, which you're showing right now is uh, I2M, Teens, Media Arts and Belonging. But there was another one that we've done uh, most recently called the Critical Makers Lab, which we'll speak about in just a second. Okay, <laughs> she goes, that's Sorry. the first one. Um, we've used the I2M moniker to frame um, and brand our efforts. It comes from I, the poem I2 by Langston Hughes, in which Langston Hughes spoke about or wrote about the disenfranchisement of Black people during the Harlem Renaissance, this was in the 1920s and 30s, and advocated for a greater recognition and a greater sense of belonging and respect for people of color in the United States. So we use that as a platform to think about critical issues of literacy, media literacy and identity, and also to engage our young people in critical making practice. So critical makers, critical media community projects, I2M programs have included critical making activities tied to environmental education, uh, public exhibitions and cross school collaborations. So in November of 2020, we started the Critical Makers Lab, uh, which I was going to go back to that. So in 2020, we started the Critical Makers Lab virtually working with Los Angeles schools to implement our third initiative in the I2M series, which was, this Critical Makers Lab is a six part media making workshop that's anchored in the CMP curriculum and focuses on key themes of identity, place, belonging, visibility, stereotypes, and advocacy. Student media projects from the schools and the after school program that was a part of the Makers Lab are housed in this public facing work website where students can view the work of their peers um, from other institutions as well as from their own school. So as part of our expanding CMP universe, uh, these programs bolster our efforts to provide opportunities for young people that align with emerging formulations of 21st century civic education and literacy. So now we wanna shift over. I'm gonna stop sharing so we can see people. And I'm gonna um, ask each of our workshop um, collaborators to introduce themselves, uh, to tell about their role and their connection and how they got involved in Critical Media Project and Critical Makers Lab. And just to kind of talk a little bit about what they get out of collaboration, what collaboration kind of means to them. So I'm gonna start with uh, Jillian Russell. Hi, everybody. My name is Jillian Russell. I am a senior at USC, and I actually took one of Allison Trope's 
courses at Annenberg at USC. And that's how I got connected with her. And I became a part of the Critical Media Project and also one of the USC student mentors in the Critical Makers Lab, the I2AM program that you just all heard about with those fabulous um, different workshops that we had. We had six different projects that we workshopped with the teams in local schools. And um, I worked specifically with the Ambassador School of Global Leadership in Koreatown, um, where Mr. Legaspi and I connected as well, who is also here in this lovely panel. And it was such a wonderful time because we were able to really realize the importance of collaboration. And I think that that whole process, that experience gave me a different view of collaboration even because we were not physically in the classroom. We were on Zoom just like this, but we were still able to reach one another and hear from each other and hear each other's stories. And there was a really beautiful power in all of that. And it was really wonderful to be a part of. So to me, collaboration, I think, is coming together and listening, but also, um, so telling your story, but also learning to be a wonderful listener in collaboration and building off of what that other person has to say um, for the better. But yes, I, I will hand it back to Allison so she can hand it over to the next member of the panel. Okay, we're, I'm gonna pass the baton to Carolina. Hi everyone, my name is Carolina Ferreira. I'm from Brazil and I've been a part of the CMP project since uh, February uh, 2021. I love studying communication. I study journalism here in Brazil at Universidade Federal de Pelotas. And I was searching about communication projects when I found CMP and I contacted Alison and she was really great. She offered me to participate in the meetings and so I've been learning a lot uh, with all of them. And I think collaboration is about that, about learning with different people, about sharing experiences, sharing knowledge. Uh, here in Brazil, we have uh, very different types of media and very different types of uh, communication studies. So it is a great experience to be able to participate in this project. And as Jillian said, even uh, only on Zoom and I'm here in Brazil and we can still have this great experience. So I usually product, uh, produce content for the CMP website and I've been working on a, a playlist about hate speech and hate in general. And I think that's it. Great, and I'm gonna share, we don't have Carolina's playlist up yet but I'm gonna share uh, where the playlists are located on the site. Um, let's, let's turn it over to Jessica. Yeah, um, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on what time zone folks are in. Uh, I'm Jessica, I'm a doctoral student in the Annenberg School for Communication at USC. Uh, my research looks at abolitionist student activists and their imaginings for the future of the university. And I've been involved with CMP since I started in the program and now in my fourth year. Um, I mostly do work on the website, but I am kind of, I would say involved in all of the conversations around what we do. And and, um, and I think that's really because I, I really, the thing I really appreciate about CMP is, is kind of how we all come from these like different social and theoretical and political backgrounds and we're and we're coming up with this shared vision and shared goals about like utilizing a very over-resourced university um to try and like move some of those resources into other spaces um so for me that's like a really wonderful part of the collaborative collaborative work that we are doing great thank you jessica Jessica's been a backbone for it for us. So I couldn't do this work without her. And finally, last but not least, I want uh, Enrique Legaspi to introduce himself. Enrique is actually my longest standing partner in this whole endeavor. So Enrique, take it away. Thank you, Allison. My name is Enrique Legaspi, an educator from Los Angeles. I've been made an American inspired by the world. Um, I've been uh, partnering and collaborating with Allison's Critical Media Project for oh, almost over five plus years now. And uh, in my first iteration, it was really about how it was going to look like in ethnic studies. And so we were able to create some really great uh, performance tasks and projects using Critical Media Project, um, really getting students to ask 
higher level questions so they can synthesize the content that they're creating and then really asking and analyzing the content that they're creating or collaborating on with others. Um, I think um, now I'm in this place where I'm at a school that's a candidate for an international baccalaureate. And so now what we're really trying to do is think of how Critical Makers Lab, Critical Media Project uh, can look in a community project, in a personal project. Uh, because at the end of the day, we want our students at our school to, to raise awareness, uh, we want them to join conversations, find answers to their questions, especially as it relates to identity, and really reflect on their own learning. And so I think what's been so awesome about uh, partnering uh, and collaborating with uh, Dr. Trope, DJ, and the entire CMP Critical Makers Lab team is that we've been able to imagine new possibilities through this collaboration, make a difference, take action, and really solve, uh, if not think about solutions to different problems that we care about. Thank you so much. So as you can see, our collaborative um, practice runs the gamut and sort of uh, we hit it at various levels from undergraduate education to graduate PhD level to um, DJ and I being in different schools uh, at USC, Annenberg and Cinematic Arts um, to working with someone like Carolina, who is in an entirely different country and time zone in Brazil, to, uh, to working with our school partners, Enrique um, representing one of uh, several schools that we're working with in Los Angeles. So we are passionate about collaboration, but we also see that collaboration can sometimes be challenging. And so what we want to do today is, is put you in breakout rooms. Um, and have you use this Padlet that we have uh, constructed, and I will we'll share that in the chat. Um, and we want you to think about, and just wait for your breakout rooms for a minute. Um, we want you to think about sort of generally how you define collaboration, how you see collaboration, um, thinking about how it's valued, how it can be facilitated or harnessed, but also thinking about those challenges or obstacles um, that we face. And so we're gonna kind of introduce these, these provocations and then we're gonna have you come back in about 15 minutes or so and, and kind of have a group discussion about what collaboration can look like. And we'll share some of our stories, but we really wanna hear from you. Um, and we're gonna to try to use the Padlet by the end of the conversation to sort of also think about what kind of vision do we want to, to have as critical media literacy educators, as critical media literacy practitioners? How do we want to, to kind of form a vision of collaboration? And I think it really fits well into the spirit and theme of the conference. So I am going to, I haven't done the breakout room thing for a while, but I am going to create, so we're in either groups of two or three. And hopefully you saw the Padlet in, um, in the chat. So make sure you click on that before I put you in breakout rooms so that we are good. Wait, people are leaving, so I wanna make sure. Okay. So go ahead into your breakout room. Okay, we have a, like a couple more seconds, I think, and the people will be back. So hang tight. Okay, I think everyone should be back now. So um, I hope that was, oh, that was great, says Mary. Yay, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm going to put the Padlet link in again because a couple people just joined. Um, I may have to do it again because more people are coming in. Um, so for those of you who are just entering, what we did is a little exercise. You know, this is about critical media collaborations. And I'm putting the Padlet in that we just used. And we were thinking about two provocations. One was um, 
getting pe folks to think about what what elements are challenging, what elements run counter or are counterproductive to collaboration. So I thought we could just share a little bit back what what you shared on the Padlet, um, what you found insightful, what resonated with you in your breakout rooms. And please don't be shy. Got enough of that with my students all week, so. If I could could uh, offer to start the conversation, um, one of the things that we spoke about in our small group, in our breakout room, was issues of power and how there are always going to be these issues of power at play. Um, if, if someone is a professor and someone else is, is a 14-year-old, people's voices aren't heard the same way. And obviously, uh, um, our positionalities, our racialized identities, um, um, our gendered identities uh, related to class, all the things that we think about in critical media literacy come into play in the spaces in which we collaborate. And we can't wish those things away. But what we can do is we can acknowledge them and talk about them as we set kind of ground rules and expectations and think about how we might try to mitigate, right? Or how we, how we might lessen that uh, uh, power asymmetry uh, and I think that that's really important to think about um, when setting uh, a space or building a space together that is going to be truly collaborative and not just an exercise in domination or power. Yeah, I think that's so important thinking about um, student agency around, and I know Jessica is very passionate about this, coming up with a syllabus together, which is something Jessica did last year for an abolitionist class she came up with. So she co-created the syllabus with, with students that were undergraduate and graduate, really giving students agency around and choice around um, how we do things. So I think, Noah, thank you for, for uh, starting us off there. I'm just gonna share the Padlet again in case anyone just joined. So we're talking about some of the challenges in, uh, in thinking about or engaging in collaboration, what is counterproductive um, to collaboration? Anyone else have anything they wanna share? Yeah, Andy. Is it, is it okay if I uh, just say, like I think in some ways on the, on the positive side, uh, to some extent, this conference is a model of one kind of response to provocation too. Um, it, it's, it's open in a double sense. It's, it's free. There's no uh, economic barrier uh, to participation, unlike many professional conferences. Um, it's also virtual, so it's not geographically limited. And those are both positives. But thinking about it in terms of provocation one, um, of course, it hinges on internet access, um, and and I think probably everyone uh, participating in a conference on on uh, critical media literacy is keenly aware of notions of the digital divide and so forth and so on. So that I don't think that's the like a primary um, element of what makes collaboration uh, 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 counter or unproductive. Other people on the tablet are, are padlet are noting a number of really crucial fundamental factors, but just at the technological and kind of media level of it, um, that's, I, I think it's important just to register that. Like yeah. this conference is open in many ways compared to other kind of professional scholarly conferences, but it still has as a fundamental limitation, um, you know, the existence, uh, you know, access to internet, um, for individuals, and then uh, uh, you know our dependence, at, even as critical media scholars, uh, uh, critical media literacy scholars, our dependence on um, these corporate platforms. Yes. Um, and and so you know we can make use of them to 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 question and problematize them, but we're we're you know that dependency on them is um, is is still a reality. Yeah, and I think, you know, to that point, and everyone on the steering committee could speak to this, it's just the, the piece not only about access and internet access, but how do you, how do you promote and engage? How do you reach, you know, as big an audience um, as you think would be interested in such a conference and, and get them to come um, and get them to, to partake in the collaboration? And, and I think, you know, for Critical Media Project and, and some of the work we do, one of the most difficult things is how do we, how do we do outreach? How do we actually get collaborators? How do we get folks like Enrique 
um, teachers or admin at different schools to really not only just look at the site, um, but talk to us and, and kind of try to engage. Um, so Andrew is saying at UCLA, students continue to ask, how can I bring critical media literacy to my family, friends, and communities, right? So I think we all have this kind of, um, kind of uh, idea that we want to do the good work, but, but then there are these different obstacles, you know, at an interpersonal level, at an institutional level, as well as at a technological level. Anyone else want to share any obstacles? Yeah, Jillian. Yes, yeah, so I was actually in a group with Noah and Ali, and we had talked about those power dynamics um, and how they can cause issues within the classroom with allowing everybody to feel included and, and welcome and safe in that space. But also um, when I was doing the critical makers lab, I noticed that there were some students who were more willing to share than others, ones that wanted to turn on their camera, be more present in conversation on Zoom um, and share their voice. And it's interesting to me because I think that the students who did participate more we were able to have a collaboration. I knew more about their projects. Other students in the classroom knew more about them personally, but those who were more quiet, um, more reserved, which is definitely okay too. I didn't know as much about what was going on with their work and that broke that point of collaboration in some ways. Um, and so I think it's also really key to create a safe environment where everybody does feel welcome and everybody feels like even if their voice is something that the rest of the room might not understand, they're willing to listen. And that will allow that collaboration to continue on as well, as long as everybody feels comfortable coming into that environment as themselves and gets to speak their minds, then I think the collaboration will work. Otherwise, I think it kind of breaks. Yeah. But that's yeah. something we talked about. Yeah, and I think that does echo what Noah said, who was in your room about how do you create a space in the classroom? How do you hold space for collaboration? And what does that look like? Um, Ralph, you put a comment. I don't know if you're willing to unmute and sort of elaborate on it a little bit. Um, sure. I think that one of the, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll blame Andy for this because he uh, used the word sociology. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work with Zygmunt Bauman lately. Um, and have learned an enormous amount, but he also has this kind of despairing suggestion that because of the increasing level of fragmentation, the amount of sort of media culture environment that we share has become harder and harder to pin down so that we're, you know, in some cases on kind of isolated, you know, it can be an isolation by what platforms we participate in. It can be isolation based on what we have and haven't seen or haven't, haven't read. Um, and it's just become exacerbated by how individual our experiences with these media environments are. And then, you know, how much, I don't know how to say this, so it doesn't sound like weird, but how much we've watched, how much we've listened to, and, and how we integrate those into conversations, because we do consume a lot of things without necessarily, you know, bringing them into a critical dialogue. Um, and then when you, when you do that, it, it starts to build out that kind of mutual space, but it's a lot of work, you know, yes. and people have to be willing to do it. Yeah. No, I think that's the the labor piece and and then the you know the politics of it, you know, even if we embrace the politics, we might get burned out um, in some sense by by the labor. I think that's a really good point. Um, I'll just share quickly um, because DJ had had brought this up to me and reminded me of one experience I had personally, just thinking about collaboration. As, as a researcher or an academic, um, someone was going to engage in a similar project to critical media project. Um, and it was someone who was senior to me in, in the academy and basically said to me, um, well, I may be putting you out of business. And I just, I was taken aback because I just thought it's not collegial for one thing. Um, and it, it's seated in, competition essentially over collaboration and and it was really disappointing and and yet I think that is the academy in a lot of ways the academy can be a very competitive place as much as it can be a very collegial um, space so yes this is another way of thinking about power in terms of ranking in terms of you know who has more grant money um, and so that was really disappointing to me and I'm still kind of trying to figure out how to how to navigate that. And then another piece that I'd like us to all think about is how many 
organizations are out there. So Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas is sort of a fledgling, I would say, organization. Um, but how many other organizations are out there, um, namely, or critical, um, I'm trying to think of the other organizations that are more on the national level um, that are doing either media literacy work or critical media literacy work, probably less on that front. But to what degree are they fostering, helping to foster collaboration, you know, um, or to what degree are they, you know, doing things on their own? So thinking about Media Literacy Week, which is coming up soon, um, that, that Namely is putting on, you know, how much of that is really actually helping to, to foster collaboration or how much of it is really just broadcasting all of these different siloed efforts that are going on around the country. So this is another kind of pet peeve of mine is just thinking about how, how can we use these, these kind of weeks or these conferences or these ways in which we do gather to foster collaboration a little bit more. Um, so I wanna move on to the second provocation just to talk about it a little bit before we get into the last thing. What do you value? Um, sort of the flip side of the first question. So the first question was, what are the challenges? What do we find that's counterproductive? But what do we value? And how do we define collaboration in, in terms that sort of speak to our pedagogical and other values? What does collaboration look like? So this sort of feeds into the idea of a manifesto or a strategic vision. What is collaboration good for? I can start, yes. um, which I we spoke about in our group. But I I think so deeply about how collaboration teaches me about the limits of my own imagination and my own ability. Um, and I I like I I mean this is oh, I talk to you about this all the time, Alison. But I hate academia because <laughs> academia is so invested in this idea that an individual can produce good work when anything good I've ever produced has been in collaboration with other people. And I think I think in reality, most of the good work produced by individuals is actually produced in collaboration and then just under one person's name a lot of the time. And so I think it's, I mean, it, it also then like obviously perpetuates all these narratives of individual success that can tie to what you were just saying. Um, but I think, I think that I just I just think my ability to imagine things and to like have ideas is so much bigger and broader when I'm working with other people. So for me, that's that's really uh, at the like I'm I I just think I'm I'm a better person and a better academic and a better human when in collaboration with other people. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I want to highlight two things you said, because I think you said two different things. One is that collaboration is like a check on you, right? It's It sort of gives you that insight into your own limits, but then it also, you know, ex is expansive. It broadens um, the perspective, which I think we've all probably experienced, um, you know, in working with groups that, you know, bouncing ideas off, et cetera. Um, any, anyone else have any thoughts on what they value about collaboration, what collaboration can mean in an ideal sense? Well, I just want to add really briefly, Allison, I'm really sorry that someone said that to you or suggested that it's a zero sum game, because I think all of us who work in any dimension of media literacy understand that what we're doing is multiplying, not, you know, not picking some and leaving others behind that kind of misses the whole point so yeah yeah as i said very disappointing um connie oh who was who was about i'm sorry to i just oh, wanted to say that that it also we have to think about our theories of change right yeah. are we in this work to try to to publish or build the name or get the next grant or is it about creating the change we want to see uh in in whatever sort of system or or you know, for me, it's insights of public education and, and you know, how, how do we see that happening if not in collaboration? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's so true. And I feel like we're kind of preaching to the choir maybe in this, in this um, workshop. So I think the other hurdle we have to think about is how do we 
um, get other folks on board with that kind of idea, right? To sort of see the power of collaboration and the use and the value of collaboration. And again, I think in academic context, we're often working against that. Mary, you have your hand raised. Just to build on that, I mean, I think the, <laughs> the structures of academia higher ed will ensure that collaboration is not, is not the primary goal. It's not how the reward structures are set up. It's more likely to take root in um, K-12, uh, perhaps in you know, a community college settings, but higher education, the further up you go, I've actually heard people say, we, if they say they're a team player, we don't want them. Mm -hmm. So and that's a reality. I think anybody who's worked in <laughs> academia knows that. So I think we would need to change the reward structures. Uh, if you want to see the behaviors change. Mm. So interesting. So change the institution in a radical kind of way to make it work, um, incentivize <laughs> almost. Well, good luck with that, Mary, right? Um, uh, Jillian, you have your hand up. Yes, I think there's some really excellent points being made about how in the US we're very individualistic culture, I think that we always are kind of working to move forward, get ahead. Um, in journalism, especially, which is what I'm studying, it's like, you know, getting a byline, get a single byline from when you apply for jobs. I've done a lot of collaborative projects in Annenberg, but when you apply for internships or roles, they want single authored byline articles or single authored projects. So it's interesting that we value independent work over collaborative work. And it's I find that so strange because there's this quote that my best friend always says she's when she like helps me or I help her she'll be like yeah like the tide you know a good tide lifts all the boats because she says like we rise by lifting others we rise by lifting each other I'm like that's such a poetic way to say that and I wish that we could do that more within academia and show there is power in helping others amplify their voices, their ideas, or just validating, like, I agree with you, or like, that's a great point. Um, it can be a revolutionary um, practice in the classroom and just in the workplace for the future, I think, if we were to change that mindset, that individualistic mindset. Yeah, and I, I think we're working against the grain, as you're saying, because we're working against an American mythology and an American value system. And um, it's kind of sad in that respect. That, but, but it also gives me hope that, you know, in especially in a K through 12, when we hit folks young, maybe that's where we can, you know, try to foster this spirit a little bit more. So I wanted to um, call on Andy and then Enrique. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I think picking up on that against the grain idea, it is a counter system approach. Critical media literacy is a counter system approach. Um, and so one of the challenges in terms of expanding kind of the participation in, in, you know, in critical media literacy endeavors is to overcome the idea that it's exclusively uh, the domain of progress, pol political progressives. Um, and that there's, I don't have the answer for this one, but I think it's important um, to work on what the answer might be. Like, how do you, in, how do we engage people who see themselves as politically conservative uh, when the, uh, the perception, whether it's accurate or not, is that anyone engaged in critical media literacy is grinding, a, 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 is grinding, a, if not a, 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 a progressive, radical left uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and that uh, ties in, sorry, that, 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 that ties in with exactly the kind of uh, individualistic mindset that uh, Jessica and others uh, have been talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Jessica, I think, um, gave a nod to Connie who, um, who wrote, you know, what she values in collaboration um, or what she sees sort of embodying collaboration around global awareness, citizenship and cultural responsiveness. And Connie actually, I didn't know was going to be here. So Connie was my student in at USC and now I didn't even know is, is working in Brazil herself. Um, Connie, are you still here somewhere? There you are. I am. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Tro. Hi, do you wanna? 
chat a little bit about what, what you were saying you valued there? Of course, of course. So um, I've had a little bit of experience working with Critical Media Project and with Dr. Tropes, it's amazing. And it really kind of, um, it's something I've always kept in the back of my mind as I um, started becoming an educator. I taught in Massachusetts and now I'm teaching in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, but I find that, and I'm working at an international school here. So we do work with an American curriculum. And I find that although the children are, children here are very diverse. I don't have any American students. They're all Brazilian or uh, uh, from other countries in Latin America. And I find that American uh, media is so influential. They're influenced by, they know all the trends, they're all on TikTok, right? Um, they used to watch the advertisements, they watch the movies produced in Hollywood. And um, I've also had experience working in um, some entertainment industries in LA as well. Um, but I find that it's it's been difficult to try to translanguage or like um, incorporate a lot of the research and material that's being conducted. It's It was easier to implement it when I was teaching in the US, but now I think working abroad, I find that it's really important to also, uh, you know, think about not just in the American context of how the media is influencing um, our, our kids in the United States, because it's influencing kids, I think, globally. And so I, I kind of am now looking to see how we can, you know, expand that view whenever we produce produce something, for example, on the critical media project website or on the research paper of how just beyond the borders of the United States, kids are being influenced. However, I think there needs to be some additional cultural sensitivities and cultural responsiveness so that the students here can, you know, respond to that. And um, <laughs> yeah, um, and um, have that sense of urgency to of um, a critical media literacy inside the classrooms. So uh, yeah, I, I'm super happy to see you here. Yeah. Um, and um, I think it's such an important topic and I'm, I'm trying to find my own people here to see how I can use media as a resource to continue to educate. Great, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing uh, what you end up doing. Um, Enrique, you've had your you had your hand up before. I'm I'm gonna see if you were able to chat. There you are. Oh, I don't know if we can hear you. Not really. So uh, let me see if he. How about now? Oh yeah, good. Perfect. Awesome. I just wanted to say really quickly, we cannot pretend to do it alone. I think um, things that we could do to uh, get this change to happen is exactly what I heard Dr. Chope say earlier, let's invest in our youth. They are the future. So that in essence, they could take what we're doing in K through 12 and hopefully shift that culture of that individualism. I mean, what I'm trying to do right now is rethink assessments at my site. You know, a lot of assessments are individualistic. So how can we start thinking about some collaborative performance assessments, right? So that you can start to scale it. Just wanted to share that. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think that's a really good point. Um, even thinking about how, again, the institutional piece, how we are judged by the district or by the Department of Ed, or in my case, by the provost at USC, um, and, and how a lot of that is, again, about an individualistic approach. So we only have a couple minutes left, and I'm hoping we can kind of, you know, just quickly summarize, but also just think about, like, what we would want to do. So we are all part of this Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas. How can this help us move forward to sort of think about a collaborative vision um, or a manifesto around collaboration for critical media literacy? Were there things that just resonated that people said, we, we know what's maybe challenging, what's counterproductive, we have some sense of what works, are there ways we can 
I'm not giving us much time to do this, but are there things that we would pull? One thread that I would I would say really emerges for me is I just posted in the chat as Mary was talking about changing the reward structures of academic labor, we need to change the reward structures or the ways we evaluate or assess in say K-12. And that shift is the long-term shift to make this work the work that is valued. But in the short term, for me, it's about creating opportunities for a rich ecology of practice. And that's what I think is so useful about this kind of space is that it's not about coming to get the line on the CV or you know, once a year you show up to just pontificate. It's what's the work we're doing throughout the rest of the year? And then we share it once a year and try to learn from it to grow our own praxis. Yeah, I think that's great. So finding ways to make this work generative um, for the collective, I think is partly what you're saying. Um, and I think the, the reward structures and the assessment piece is really important. I think, you know, there's too much reliance, even at the, at the higher ed level on Bloom's taxonomy, which is not a great taxonomy for this kind of work. It doesn't value this kind of collaboration. Um, it doesn't value a politics of care. It doesn't value the, the kind of way we might evaluate a portfolio or a group work the way Enrique was talking about in comparison to this kind of individual practice. Um, Jessica, you have your hand up. Maybe you can bring us home. Yeah, I, I, I'll try and do a positive note, but I, I think a lot, um, I don't know if folks have had a chance to read Mariam Kaba's new book, but she, um, which is We Do This Till We Free Us, um, and she talks about um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's call to that uh, abolition requires we change everything, and that changing everything um, can like sound really daunting, but actually changing everything means that we have infinite starting points. Um, and and uh, she also directly says infinite opportunities to collaborate um, and that like the possibilities then are endless if we have to change everything. And so I think for me, that's like a really useful way of, of when I get caught up in how unbelievably uh, awful every part of everything, but particularly academia often feels, I'm also like, every single little thing we do to resist it is like trying to change everything. Um, and so maybe that's not super useful towards like clear practical steps, but I think I think like allowing ourselves that breadth to be like everything we do, we can do differently than what is currently being done can for me be really useful yeah. in this industry. I think just even envisioning other ways we can deploy institutional work, right? Envisioning, you know, again, this critical media conference as an organization, how can we really, you know, kind of rethink what, what it means to be an institution, what it means to be a collaborative institution. So I wanna just thank everyone so much for coming and for generously participating and collaborating um, with us. And we really hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and, um, and I'm going to share the Padlet one more time in case people want to kind of peruse and keep adding. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of our thank you. session organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Collaborative round of applause. Amazing, amazing. Thank you all so much. Incredible job. Yes, then it's okay. We'll go ahead and stop recording. Fabulous.